There you All go. right. Yeah. Well, you guys may not believe this, but but we're going to change today, and we're going to step out from Mark. And uh, did you know there was more than one other than, than the Gospel of Mark? There really is. <laughs> so we're going to go into uh, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter eleven. And for those of you who are joining us as part of this conversation, this Sunday is Mother's Day. And uh, on Mother's Day, it's been a part of the ministry for me over the last oh, probably 25 years that my wife preaches every Mother's Day. And so the text we're going to look at today is Matthew 11, 25 through 30. And um, we're going to jump into that and have a conversation around it as we uh, get ready for this day to celebrate uh, our moms and the impact they have made on our lives. And I, I, you know, I can say for me this year and for my wife, Nancy, this is a different Mother's Day than we've, we've had in all of our lives because this is the first year that we will have Mother's Day without our moms. And we are so grateful for their lives. Um, and both of them went to go be with Jesus this last year. And my mom beat her mom to the finish line. So just by about uh, four months. And so we're grateful for their lives. And we'll reflect on this text in light of Mother's Day today. So, um, and if you haven't had a chance, we want to introduce a new staff member to you. Um, Lauren Fairbanks is joining our staff as pastor to online ministry. So after this next Sunday, anything that goes wrong in online ministry, <laughs> we feel like we can tell you, we can have somebody we can throw the blame at. That's what it's really all about. There you go. Right? <laughs> or our bad training. Or <laughs> what do you say, Eddie? It could be our bad uh, communication too, though. We'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> So, Lauren, it's great for you to join us. We're sure glad to have you as part of our team, and you'll be joining us each week in these conversations. So uh, we're going to take a look at, again, chapter 11 of Matthew. If you want to turn there, we're going to look at verses 25 through 30. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Eddie, our worship pastor, if he would pray for us. And then, Lauren, would you do us the honor of reading the passage of Scripture? Kind of give us the version that you're reading from, because a number of us read from other versions. And then we will begin to look at that and jump in together. So, Eddie, go ahead. Lord, we thank you for this uh, time that we come together. And thank you for this time of year, Lord, to um, honor and celebrate the mothers in our lives, whether that's our um, biological mothers that have that have raised us up or whether that's a spiritual mother that we remember or uh, grandmothers or those that are that are been impactful lord that's a it's a role that you've given us that we are so thankful to be recipients of each in different areas in different ways and we know god that the scripture tells us that you are the father of everything good all the good and perfect gifts come from you and so we thank you god for the the moms in our lives who've helped shape us pray as we look into this scripture that you would bless our conversation and help us to um, see the truth that you want us to see. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Well, today I'll be reading Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30, and this is the NIV version of scripture. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So what do you, what do you see? Uh, first thing that kind of jumps to me is that uh, this little passage starts with Jesus declaring thanks. Uh, so I uh, something 
something about it jumped off the page to me today that he he begins his whole statement with declaring thanks for who God is and for for um what God has done and his graciousness yeah it's interesting the whenever you see um kind of throwbacks it's it's nice to go and look back and see what what he's talking about because that first verse with praise it says i praise you god because you have hidden these things from wise and learned and revealed them to little children and you think what is he talking about what are these things and you know the passage right before that he's denouncing towns which uh <laughs> which didn't believe that they they didn't repent they saw miracles and they didn't repent and and even before that he's talking about um you know, John the Baptist trying to prepare the way and people not realizing it and people not seeing. And so it's it's kind of neat to be like, to remember what the context might be or to see what the context might be that um, the like these deep truths about who he is, um, what he's come to do, uh, how some of these have been hidden by from people that are supposed to be in the know, quote unquote, or mm -hmm. people that the world might think are the wise and learned right and and that seems to happen a lot that sometimes you have people that are put up on a pedestal whether they wanted to be there or not sometimes but their level of understanding we kind of default to it and we're like oh they know they i guess they must know and and there's some things that are just sometimes jesus reminds us like no they're hidden from these and they're made plain to little children people like little children but uh, which is an interesting connection because I think the idea um, there's something earlier today as we were going through some of our other staff planning that I, I had this thought earlier today too that sometimes we have um, things that happen in life and we wish we could explain them but we really can't manage to explain them but if you told a kid well this is what I know then they generally kind of go oh okay you don't need any more depth and you, like you don't need me to cite sources for you and tell you why and no okay i get it that's the answer thank you i can go on now and and i think that sometimes that's yeah we look to people who are supposed to know stuff and really god going would you just kind of tell me yeah okay god thank you and be at peace with what i just told you that this is this is how i am this is how world is mm. oh okay thank you and the acceptance that little kids will just soak that up instead of the pushback and the pushback and the pushback sometimes i think i think that's some of the picture of how he wants our heart to be toward him sometimes we can think we are so intelligent that we're smarter than god and our hearts and our minds become closed to what he's trying to reveal to us, who he is. Um, it reminds me again that, that in all the studies that we do, or the research that we do to keep that childlike heart that listens mm -hmm. for the, the Holy Spirit and what he's, what he's trying to say. You know, one of the things that I think of when I'm looking at a passage or something, um, I usually ask the question, okay, what is this telling me about God? And sometimes you get some passages that are, are seeming, seems to be pretty difficult to find an answer to that question. Uh, verse 28 uh, through 30, it doesn't, it's pretty outlined for us, which is a kind of a good reminder. It just, you know, says some characteristics, I would say quite plainly, um, you know, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Uh, this is what's God's character. It's a, it's a God that gives people rest. Those who are going through all sorts of stuff, those who have these difference, he's a God who provides us with rest. He says, let me teach you. God is a teacher. Um, he says, I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give is light. That last passage, always something difficult mm -hmm. for me to wrestle with. Because as I, you know, as you read 
scripture and stuff as you read is like so much it seems like and I don't know if we make it in a sense like too legalistic and stuff but like I know the Christian walk for me it's it's a walk that never gets done your faith never like you never get to a point where you can check off the last thing and say all right like done all the thing it's like there's something constantly to be like working on and doing and like improving on and getting better on and growing in your faith with God and so it's there's a tension there for me to in reading this passage that oh the, you know the yoke I give uh, is easy to bear and the burden I give is light light but it's like but God's also calling people out to like you know go into different nations and uproot their life and to like bring people you know or like to minister to the broken and to like bring about the kingdom of God like this is a high responsibility I would say for us as Christians and yet there's this I don't know there's there's some peace in it. But I think for me, at least, there's a bit more tension. So I don't know if you guys can give some insight to some of that. But when I read this verse, the first thing that comes to my mind is not no, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, there seems to be an underlying truth that the way God created us was that we we're meant to do things. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We're meant to carry a burden. We're meant to pursue something, to strive towards something. Um, somebody called it, um, I was listening to a podcast. They said, you know, a human being is a beast of burden. It's like, oh, that's an interesting way to think of it. Like we were built to, uh, to kind of be like co-creators with God in a sense. Like we were mm -hmm. built to farm the land. We were built to... Uh, pull something out of a pile of dirt you know it's it's it just like our creator he created us in his image and and i think sometimes we get that idea of rest as being come to me and i will give you rest i will take away all your burdens i will take away all your yokes he says no let me let me trade trade it for someone that's easy and one that's light and i think i think the striving and the the trying and the struggle that the thing that wears us out is when we're working to the wrong purpose. Um, when it's not mm. as high as partnering with God, like if it's, there's something that we're striving for and we realize the futility of it because it's not in line with God, boy, that wears you out. Like if you want to, if you want to dig holes all day and there's no higher goal, it's like, it doesn't matter how much you want to pay a person to do that. They'll, they'll, they'll stop doing it at some point if there's no purpose to it. It's like, man. Yeah. It, sometimes holding that purpose is hard. Like, and I think Levi, that's some of the tension you're speaking to is remembering that there is purpose to some of what we do. Um, there's a song I heard two, two weeks ago now, and it has just resonated with me. So I pulled it up because I think it connects. So I'm going to read some of the lyrics for us. Okay. Um, it's called your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained. Your planting and reaping are never the same. But your labor is not in vain. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. For I have called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. I mean, through some of the other verses, but it just just that whole idea where sometimes we feel like we're working and working and working and we feel like we're not going anywhere so there's some of the tension maybe Levi of well, I don't feel like I ever get something done and yet here's Jesus is but my yoke is easy and then the song resonates into that your labor is not in vain like what what you're digging what you're doing when it is like Eddie said when it's partnered with with me I think Jesus is getting at it's not in vain and you may be weary, but you, you can come to me and it's not wasteful and it's not, it doesn't have to be burdensome when you're partnered with me, um, which is a, is a challenge to live into, especially after the year we've had, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. right? I think everybody's exhausted of constant change and constant wondering and constant tension and so we go, I don't know if anything's worth it right now, but no, I think Jesus has an invitation here about, no, it, it is. You come to me with that childlike heart, come to me because it's, I, I 
can carry, my yoke is easy, right? You're going to be working through this, but come with me. And then it's restful and it's not burdensome. Well, I find it interesting because it, it almost seems contradictory in this text. So <laughs> it's as in verse, um, uh, in verse 25, um, I praise you, Father, which the word praise there is an interesting word. It's an idea of the word confess. It means I agree with um, Lord of heaven and earth because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to learn little children. So it makes it sound like, okay, God doesn't want anybody to who's wise and learned to learn this stuff. But then you go down to verse 28 and it says, come to me all you. So there's this all, this idea that the invitation is for everybody, mm -hmm. but we come as children. Let's talk for a moment. I have a question about what is rest? What is rest and what is yoke? Those almost again seem at odds with one another because um, rest has this idea of peace. Uh, yoke has this idea that I'm tied to somebody. I'm tied to something. You know, if you've seen two oxen all yoked up, um, one is uh, they've got to work in unison together. So, so let's talk about rest and yoke. So we notice there in the text that he doesn't say he's going to remove our yoke, does he? Right. He says he will replace that yoke, right? Because his yoke is easy. Um, so is there's a sense of, um, and I think for me, it goes back to the previous verse, um, verse 27, where he talks about no one knows the son except the father. Um, and no one knows the father except the son. This idea of knowing him, um, knowing him is not simply being wise and learned, right? Knowing him is a relationship. And I think that's what he's alluding to here is, is this foundation of relationship that um, when we're able to take off that yoke or he's able to take off that yoke, that burden that we have in this life, burden of sin, burden of stress, burden of anxiety, all the things that we've all experienced this past year. And he replaces that yoke with, like you said, Tim, things like peace, love, um, healing, all those things, uh, that yoke that he's putting on anew in us. And on us. Yeah, that's beautiful. That relationship, right? We, we come back to that a lot, don't we? <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I was listening this morning to a podcast talking about um, that, the, that overwhelming feeling of being burned out. Uh, and they, they talked about rest and this started to really, it, it's, it's percolating in my mind, but this idea of being able to actually rest and recover, that rest should bring us some recovery. So when we lean into this and think we still have a yoke, but it, if we're leaning into Jesus and in good spaces where he gives us rest, is that so that we recover so we are able to actually continue work? Yes, I think that they, they sound different, but I think that they work in tandem almost, or maybe a little bit one has to feed the other you know, after good work, you need to actually rest. So you recover so you can do good work. Mm -hmm. And, and that's which now that I'm thinking out loud about it, that's the rhythm of Sabbath, right? I hear you work, but then you, you rest, you recover, and now you are prepared, supposed to be prepared to work, to continue, continue actually going forward. So, so no, the yoke doesn't go away. Like Lauren's saying it, it, but it's a different kind of a yoke when we actually can recover with Jesus in relationship with him. Now what he calls us to is a different kind of work than just being completely buried down by it. I find it each is interesting that Jesus describes this yoke as, as easy and light. Now, this is the same Jesus who says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross. And it's and, and we know that eleven of these twelve disciples will die a martyr's death. So easy and light does not necessarily mean um, no conflict, mm -hmm. no suffering. What is the attraction that makes Jesus the yoke wearing the yoke of Jesus 
why would someone say, you know what, I want that yoke more than any other thing that the world is offering me? Um, the observation. Yeah, ver at the end of verse 29, um, and you will find rest for your souls, is what mine reads like. And I think the idea of rest, um, we're, we are holistic. There's like the physical rest and there's the mental, but but this idea that when you're at peace in your soul, then you still can endure the things that you need to endure. It's that peace that passes all understanding. And this idea of like, um, you know, in the book of Acts, when Stephen is martyred and he looks up to heaven and he's his face looks peaceful. It's like he's he's in the middle of being killed, but there's a peace in his soul that doesn't make sense in a worldly sort of way. And and I think that's part of the part of the thing that I'm really seeing. And this is like coming to Jesus. That's where you have peace in your soul like you don't understand mm -hmm. and you still have the burden. You still have the the cross, the daily thing that that all is sort of part of our call to follow him. But it all of a sudden you can do it because you're in the right place before him uh, and your your soul's at peace under his care. <laughs> you had mentioned, Eddie, um, you quoted um, from Paul in Philippians 4 when he says a peace that passes all understanding. And it's in Philippians 3 where Paul says, I just, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul writes all these words, of course, under house arrest, doesn't know what his future holds, pretty good chance that he's going to die for his faith. But there is this incredible peace that he has. It's a, it's an inner peace. It's not the, it's not the lack of suffering, but it is a great sense of um, hope that comes from knowing Christ and walking with Christ and being connected, yoked to him. You know, I'm yoked to him. I've got his heart. His heart is, and my heart are connected together. Yeah, it's spiritual for sure. Uh, but we get to see glimpses of it just in the way we live our lives too. Like you get to see like, imagine when you work really, really hard at a, at a goal and you're just exhausted, but you hit that goal and your heart's just at rest. It's at peace because you hit it. Or I, I, I was even thinking uh, um, sometimes when mom and dad take the kids, you know, take the grandkids and it's, it's not restful in a way, probably, but their heart is full. Like they, they play with them all day long and it's, it might be a burden, but it's one that's like, Hey, this is, you know, there's joy and there's peace and there's this sense of connection. There's something deeper that, that gives like a rest for your spirit, a rest for your soul, even though you're going through something that's difficult. Or if we, you know, we can see it on the other side too, when, when there's shared tears and shared grieving together and, and you're, you're holding somebody up who has a really tough thing they're going through. Sometimes in those moments, there's this piece of being together. So even though it's a turmoil, tumultuous time or, or something like that that we get to see glimpses of this spiritual thing just lived out that there's a rest on our spirit there's a peace in our spirit that can be different uh, or can be can coexist at the same time as as the burden of it all <laughs> but. Mm. well i sure have to agree with you on the whole kids thing because <laughs> It, for those of you joining us, we had our staff over for dinner Sunday night, and two words would describe that experience, organized chaos. Um, I think we had, what, seven children at the house? And uh, man, it, I, I had the time of my life being with all those kids, and it really was no burden. We just enjoyed it. Um, of course, then we got to let them go. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. there, was, there, there was a time of rest coming. Um, but, uh, but there is something about when we're connected to Jesus and this relationship. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit for a moment. What does it look like to wear that yoke? Obviously, it's, it's the receiving of salvation. It's, the, it's, the, as it's, it's receiving the invitation, come to me. 
Um, it, it's, it's recognizing that, that we have a burden and we're weary from something we can't, we can't resolve ourselves. We can't fix it ourselves. We keep trying, we keep working at it, keep trying to find solutions. But Jesus says, you won't find that outside of me. Um, I find it interesting that one of the stories that Jesus tells prior to this is the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist mm -hmm. is locked up under Herod. He's pretty sure he's going to die. He tells his disciples, go back to Jesus. Would you just see if he really is? I want to know that, that I'm dying for someone who I, uh, I want that confidence one more time, that sense of assurance. And, and Jesus sends back the disciples of John and he has them quote to him some passages from Isaiah that John would have known, you know, the blind see, the lame walk. And I, and I have to think that in the midst of his death, that brought, that brought, there was a peace that came with that because um, I'm in relationship with more than my cousin. He's, he's the Messiah. And I don't know that John the Baptist understood all of that, but but that that brought some comfort for him, knowing Jesus does that. I, I think you just hit a key phrase toward the end right there, um, that John the Baptist didn't understand all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's some of the childlike stuff. Uh, if we think we have to figure it all out before we take on his yoke, then we're, then we're the, those early verses of all these people who are supposed to get it, but they don't get it. And you've hidden it from the wise and the learned. Well, because they think they have to figure it out first. Right. And that's the simplicity of the child heart where you don't, kids ask questions all the time, right? Especially the younger ones, they go through that little phase where it's constant question after question and why, 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 why? But then they also will settle on, oh, okay. And you know, some of the most profound things that I've heard kind of parents thinking, oh man, now they're going to ask about this huge life issue of, you know, great tragedy or death. And, and they're going to ask me what's going on here and how am I going to answer them? And then they give an answer and then the kid's response is, oh, okay. I, okay. <laughs> but because they, there's not this urge to have to figure everything out before I can just enter into a rest with it. You know, there, there's a little bit more of that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust mom and dad or grandma just told me this. So, okay, then I trust what you tell me because of who you are to me. So, is that why the cross is so offensive? Because I just can't figure it all out. Why, yeah. would, why would it take the sacrifice of God's son to redeem my life? And because I can't figure it all out. Um, it seems foolishness to me, and I'm not going to take the leap of faith to place my trust in this Jesus who, um, who resurrected, who is, it's claimed resurrected from the dead. So, uh, yeah, it's a childlike faith. Wow. I think Connie kind of hit on it, too, that there's an element of faith that faith has to come before understanding in some cases. Mm -hmm. that we have to take that baby step of faith before we can really truly understand, you know, what, what is next for us in, in this walk of faith. And I think that's a barrier for a lot of people. Like you say, they want to have it all figured out. They want to have all the answers. They want to know all there is to know, and then they'll make that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you just got to take that first step and, and then things begin to open up for you. Mm -hmm open up and then Levi way back at the beginning, you hinted on the tension too. There's still work, right? So we do still put the yoke on, we still go. And um, I'm gonna forget which letter it is, but one of them that Paul writes, and he says, you work out your salvation. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a step of faith and you believe, and it's not check your brain at the door, but, but now we live into this yoke. And so each step, each bit of work is Jesus going with us, helping us to work it out. Uh, and if we work it out with him, it's a little, it's more peaceful. <laughs> That's his promise, right? And it's a little easier than if we try to work it out on our own. And that is a great text of scripture. It's Philippians 2.12. And, and, and it follows what's interesting. And I think we could probably wrap up with this, but it follows uh, Paul's hymn. We think an early church hymn 
that describes the nature of Jesus, which Jesus has been talking about in relationship to the Father, and and uh, that He poured Himself out, and then and then Paul talks about now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But I want us all to know something before we leave. He doesn't say work for your salvation. Yes, that's right. not the text. And 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 but it is work out. Um, so as we're wearing that yoke, as we're living in that relationship with Jesus. Um, we are being shaped into his image as we daily walk with him and seek him and grow in him and as we love him with all of our heart. So, wow, what a great invitation for us to come. And, uh, you know, weary and heavy laden, as we've said here at other places um, in, this, in this podcast, that I think a lot of people are living there today. And if you're living there, if you're listening to this and you're living there today, take the invitation. Take the invitation. And just tell Jesus that I am I want to connect with your yoke. Maybe I'm carrying some things I shouldn't be carrying today and I need to place my trust in you. And just know that when you do that, um, your prayers are heard. And our prayer for you as a staff today is that you experience what Paul did when he wrote those words and what Eddie said later early on was you, you get a peace that passes all understanding. That's our prayer for you. So thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, we're kind of anxious to find out how um, Nancy uh, preaches to this on Sunday and just how wrong probably all of us are. <laughs> but thanks for joining in. And may God bless you. May you have a wonderful Mother's Day experience. And may you find rest in Jesus. Mm -hmm.